We are live. Ooh, that looks really cool. Um, let's move that out of the way. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Chat. Mm, try that again. Hello. Welcome to Tech Chat Tuesdays. I'm Ken Rimple. I'm Sue John Capati, also known as a Snooze Doggy Dog. Yeah, I had some goofy name for myself as well. Um, and uh, we are here to talk to you about all things tech. We have a couple topics today. Um, we're going to start with our dev news. Uh, and we have like five or six uh, interesting things to chew on. And then we're going to spend a little time talking about uh, continuous learning and about uh, how we synthesize information just as kind of a, a way of discussing tools and techniques that you might find useful. I also have a book recommendation while we're talking about that too for people if you're um, finding yourself more on the knowledge end of, of uh, software engineering, where you have to kind of keep things together, work with requirements, learn search techniques, you know, finding things and keeping notes. And so I have a, a really good book to recommend. Uh, and that's our plan. So we'll start off first before we do anything else. Uh, we want to let you know, if you haven't already heard, the Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise Conference 2022 is coming up. Uh, this is our conference that we run every year. I think we're in our 16th year of this conference, uh, which is amazing. Um, and we do this two days uh, in April, usually every year. This year is hopefully the last one that will be virtual, fingers crossed. Um, but uh, we're doing virtual because of COVID. Um, and it's going to be April 19th and 20th. Uh, and it's got some amazing speakers. Uh, I'm also speaking. But anyway, uh, it's got some really good speakers. And um, it's only 150 bucks right now. So really good uh, early bird registration, which I don't know when that ends, but it's soon. So if you want to go uh, save some money, it's not going to be super expensive, but it's going to be not be 150 after this. Uh, so this April 19th and 20th. This is our sweet 16. Wow. Yeah. Can you believe it? Soon it'll drive. That scares me. Oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. Uh, we have some insane speakers. So Corey Doctorow is a science fiction fiction author and an activist and a writer and a tech person. Uh, and he's been on all sorts of stuff. He's in the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He is our keynote speaker right now. We've got him slotted for one of our keynotes. We're still uh, lining up our second keynote speaker, I believe. We also have people like uh, Gene Yang from Akita Software, James Ward and uh, Bruce Eckel, uh, who are working together on a really good Java, I think 18 talk, if that's right. I never know what version anything is anymore. <laughs> um, we have um, Richard Feldman, who we've had on the Rock Programming Language. We'll check up on him. We've got uh, developer advocate Ciara Ford from Apollo GraphQL coming on, uh, as well as Janessa Garo, also from uh, Apollo GraphQL. Jessica Kerr is coming back. We have Josh Long coming in to speak about Spring. That's going to be great. That is um, he, by the way, he's working on an update to his book on Spring Boot. So that's interesting. And uh, he's been updating it for Spring Boot and Spring 5 and some of the more advanced features that are there. So that's great. And there's already, uh, if you're interested in getting that before the talk, there's already uh, a preview of that out there. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have it's Timothy like Spann. guy with the guitars. Ignore him. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll be talking uh, about uh, Google performance metrics and how to tune things for React applications based on that. That's my talk. Uh, I thought you were going to have a jam session or something. And then I'm going to play some rock and roll power chords. Um, yeah, my son's probably rolling his eyes right now. And then uh, we have uh, Timothy Spann, uh, developer advocate from Stream Native. He's going to be talking about, we just got him. He's going to be speaking about uh, Apache Pulsar, uh, which is a streaming platform. And we have Chelsea Troy on machine learning for Mozilla. That should be really interesting. Uh, so a lot of really good stuff already. And we still have a couple slots that we're finalizing. So again, phillyemergingtech.com is coming up. Buck 50, really easy to swallow. I think it'd be a, a good thing to, to, to use. And you get the videos earlier than everybody else. So as soon as the videos are online, as someone who's uh, going to the conference, you'll get access to them. I have to ask, not to put you on the spot, uh because I, I haven't read all the bios, is Stuart Smith QJS Quantum Circuit Simulator. What is that? So apparently, and I'm going to be dragging this down a little bit. So this is talking about programming, quantum programming. Um, so I don't know enough about it, but I know that mm -hmm. uh, Andrea is really thrilled that we got him. Uh, so this is uh, QJS is a drag and drop quantum computing circuit composer and handy JS, a hand post capture recognition toolkit for WebXR. So, wow. yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly. Okay, here's his talk itself. Um, it's coming. 
I, so, I highlight this on purpose because you know emerge like one of the things about ET is we try to stay cutting edge and it's, it's talks like this that push the envelope and give people not just their day to day topics like Spring and Java but something completely out of what they probably normally do. It's really cool. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, definitely something to, to go to. Um, everyone who goes has a great time. We uh, we do use Slack pretty intensively, so there's a lot of communication during the conference between people. Sometimes the speakers get them and and answer questions and stuff. So it should be really interactive and and useful. I think. You can find out information on us if you go to chariotsolutions.com. There's a blog, so slash blog or at the resources menu. That's all our stuff. Um, but uh, we have some recent blog posts. I know that uh, in January we had uh, managing internet access for AWS workloads from Keith Smith. I'm mean, Keith Smith. Sorry, that's another person from Keith Gregory. Sorry, Keith Gregory uh, from Chariot talking about um, internet access for actual uh, servers, like, do you open the whole thing up? Do you open up a pipeline? What do you do? So that's a blog post. Uh, I just put one up there uh, last two weeks ago, uh, migrating from Enzyme to React Testing Library. Um, so React Testing Library is a couple years old, and now it's kind of the de facto testing library for React. So I've got a lot of practical examples on how that works, uh, you know, kind of like how things work with um, enzyme and then what you do with Re react testing library and so on so that goes into great detail if you're a react developer so you can find a lot of stuff up there um we're all over the map in terms of tech there are a lot of different things that we all work with iot java cloud you name it and then if you want to find us uh content from other shows we've done or from uh, just our podcast we have tech chat tuesdays and all of our emerging tech conferences are all available at youtube.com slash chariot solutions Check the playlist section uh, and you can see a whole bunch of good stuff here going back a decade uh, with tons and tons of useful tutorials, shows we've done on IoT and data frameworks, you name it. We're, we're past 6,000 subscribers now. That's awesome. That keeps going up. Yeah, it keeps rolling. It's really great. All right. So let's get into some news then. If I learn how to use my browser, there we go. Um, this one I thought was kind of fun to read um, because developers have met the enemy and it's themselves. Well, it's really us because I'm a developer and I, I agree with all these things as I've shot myself in the foot enough in my life that I think, yeah, uh, these, these are good, true things to think about. Uh, so Ben the Hosk, Hosking uh, on devgenius.io's blog. So he has some things in there, and Frederick Nietzsche uh, opens the thing up, the philosopher. The worst enemy you can meet will always be yourself. How many times, Sujan, have you worked on something and been convinced it was the stupid API or the framework, and then you realized you missed one stupid semicolon or a slash or you called the wrong uh, API call? I mean, it, honestly, that happens all the time. Every right? day. You get deep into something, and you're trying to do like four different things at once. It's very easy to do that. And you know, you end up being biased on something. So yep. you think it works a certain way and then you realize that your assumptions were completely wrong. Yep. So this whole article is of that piece. It's fun to read. So first of all, talking instead of listening, my my family would say that this is my biggest mistake. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes like the, your, your, it's the, he describes this as a dance, like you're creating software is a dance between the customer and the developer. Totally agree. Um, you're kind of like teasing around the edges and digging into things, asking questions, letting them elaborate, making sure you listen. But if you don't do that, you're going to build what you want them to have instead of what they need. That's why pair programming so, can be so powerful because you have another person with you and you can kind of cancel out some of those things. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So watch out, those, watch out because assumptions are bugs created by developers thinking they know how the software should work. Yeah. Bingo. Right. So our viewers should know that Ken pair programs with himself. Like that's how cool he is. I do. Smeagol. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Exactly. So <laughs> then there's the technical first attitude. I'm, I've run into this so many times and I've been victim of this. You get really good at a particular platform and tech and you, you want to dive into the tech first, or you want to use it as your golden hammer that like everything is solved by writing it in. Yeah blah yeah. right or like the, the sunk cost fallacy is like i've already started on this and it may not be the right solution but i've already spent so much time writing this tool or script i i need to finish writing it and we're going to yeah. use it right right i i love um speaking of, of keith um the first thing he said to me when we were walking through something a couple of years back was he said you ever hear the term yagni and i don't know why i didn't hear it before but you ain't gonna need it is so nope. true you know 
you, you don't need it. So don't put it in up front if you don't absolutely need it. You know, add, don't remove. Um, now here's one, and I want to bring this up because I've been messing around with uh, GitHub's uh, Copilot a little bit just because I was in the beta. And Copilot is an AI coding environment. The idea there, oh, my screen just got weird. Do you see that? Uh, no, you don't see a weird color on the screen? I don't know. Okay, it's strange. All right. Um, hold on, let me stop and restart. Hey, Miles, I'm going to stop. No, you would think it's a monitor issue. I'm going to stop and restart the share real quick. Hold on. Uh, share. It's better. I don't know. That's the first time we've ever had a problem with StreamYard. Yeah. Mm. These days, it's not, can you hear me now? Can you see my screen now? Oh, it's so true. Yeah. Um, so, so the, uh, where was I on this? I broke my own train of thought. Uh, well, anyway, oh, copy and paste. So, so the point being, uh, you know, you use things like uh, GitHub Copilot, or there's another one out there too, or one of the GPT-3 models or something for, for getting code snippets. Um, if it's turned on in your IDE, talk about copy and paste development. You'll be in the middle of typing something that pops a whole bunch of code in there. And I've only, been I've only turned this on for about a couple of weeks now, and I'm already really hating it because, sure, it might get you there, but you don't know what you're typing and, and pa pasting in. So yeah. it's neat for like, experimenting and playing around, but I'd probably turn it off 90% of the time unless I'm just hacking. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to just copy a solution. You want to actually understand what you're doing. Exactly. It's good for learning, but you shouldn't just, pl you know, just plop it in. Yeah, exactly. So be careful of things like Copilot. It literally will paste an entire solution for something in for you. Uh, and it's pulling them from GitHub. It's pulling them from, from learning models of public repos. Um, and, you know, sometimes those they don't match what you're doing exactly or even slightly. You could be in trouble. So don't just cut and paste. It's always bad um, to just assume that that's going to go into production. Experiment, sure, but that's where that goes. I love Infinity Gauntlet. Um, I, I haven't heard of that before, but I know I've done it to myself where you give yourself admin on everything. Someday that's going to hurt you, especially on AWS where you have, a, you have a, a credential and that credential has like admin level roles to everything. The whole point is principle of least privilege. You give yourself only what you need for that role to get what you, you need to access. You know, so just dangerous stuff. Yeah, you don't uh, want to anyway. call it snack the blip. If you've seen the Marvel What's, movie, you know, you know about what the snack, the blip. Like, you know what? I'm the only person. They wiped, half, they wiped out half of life on the universe, and uh, then eventually, it, 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 they blinked back into existence, and it's a bit like lost a period of time to the Infinity Gauntlet. So, if you do that to your production environment, and you and you blink it out of existence, and it comes back, you're screwed. So that 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 um, what do you call it? Metaphor, whatever. It it, it actually has a lot of meanings. <laughs> Now, see, I got to watch that now. All right, Miles, we have we have a project to do. My have, you seen any, have you seen any of the recent Marvel movies? No, I haven't. I'm I'm like I'm I'm in my own little world. I, I just oh, you, haven't. You need to take like a week off and and make a list and watch. <laughs> <laughs> I need a sabbatical to watch a bunch of movies, yeah. please. I'm going to do that. Um, okay, all right. Anyway, so a lot of this other stuff is pretty obvious. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but you'll if you're a developer and have been around a while, this is entertaining. And if you're just getting started, it's worth reading through some of these. Never give a quick estimate you're unsure about. That's a, that's an important one. That's yeah. a huge one, actually. I'll pop over there for a second. That's yeah. absolutely true. The corollary to that is just because the mock-up is done doesn't mean, and this is for the customer, just because the mock-up is working doesn't mean we're finished. <laughs> that's what I always used to love about you know demoing 3GL yeah. software. It's just like you put the screens together. Of the problem. You're like, yeah, so you're done. No, this is just smoke and mirrors to get you to look at what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, too funny. Sorry. All right. So uh, what not to a certain React component test? I know, by the way, just a quick note, I realize that this show is a bit UI heavy, mostly because that's the interest that I have. We're going to work on getting more backend stuff and hopefully mobile and some more cloud stuff in in the future. So we'll, we'll definitely pay more attention to that. Um, I was going through this actually as I was doing my blog uh, for, for switching from Enzyme to React testing library. Uh, and this is like the common argument you'll run into in testing. You'll have to debate with yourself is how deep to test and what to test. And I kind of like uh, what the React Testing Library's philosophy is. So I'm going to jump over to this guiding principles page of React Testing Library. 
And it says, the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. So in other words, you don't want to actually pull apart the DOM elements of the component and start clicking on things um, based on, you know, like, like the physical uh, code. You don't want to simulate the code itself. You want to act as if you're the browser user interacting with the component. Now, again, this is for testing React components, not for unit testing, right? So if you're, if you're testing a piece of functional logic and you want that logic to do something based on inputs and get outputs, by all means, unit test that code. But this is more of a once you're done with unit tests and you've done enough to the, with the with the novel code in your unit tests, you want to make sure that when your component has this particular interaction, it behaves this way. Mm -hmm. uh, his point, I did it again. His point, uh, this this uh, uh, Kent C. Dodds, who put this uh, library together with a bunch of other people, and and Martin Boren Crowd is the other person uh, who who updated this, is that you want to kind of interact as a user would interact mainly because those interactions will stay the same even if the internals, the component change, right? Uh, for the most part, they'll be less brittle than if you're actually going against, you know, internal DOM structures for everything. If it's the role of a button that you click that says save, you're probably gonna have a role button that saves. Um, but if it's more of a find this exact DOM component with this ID and this st structure uh, and trigger it, and that's a little more brittle. So is this some, is this something that fits in between like pure unit tests and end to end tests? Yeah, because actually, in fact, let me let me do a because this is I'm not a, bad figure, a lot of tests, right? There's unit tests and there are these type of tests and there's like Selenium or uh, Cypress or whatever tests. So yep. like that's a huge amount of test surface area, and I'm wondering like where do you prioritize? So like the whole pyramid thing, right? The, the test pyramid is usually like you got a lot of unit tests and you've got some integration tests that kind of put things together. These are kind of like integration to partly user interaction tests is what they okay. are. You're, you're mounting components and making them live in some way. Now you, you, you can, as an integration test, you can mock the back end. So you can say, when I go to hit this URL, give me this fake response. That's not the same as a true like Cypress test, a, a, right. a web test, but these are like two thirds of the way in. So if you've got yeah. kind of complex interactions, the idea is, you know, let's see here. Okay. And I'll pull this like from the that. blog. So you're, you're testing certain, co certain complex interactions. Right. So I've okay. got this component letter in my game. And when you click on the letter, it uses it. And when you, un and it marks it as not being enabled. And when you click it again, it would flip it back again. So this is the kind of test we're talking about. So you might mock the actual function just to make sure you actually ran it and it worked. Um, that's not completely finished in this example because I do a little more with it later. But the idea is you're rendering a component in React and then you can do things like trigger events. So for example, let me find a better example here. And yeah, you would probably do this at the component level because then that component is tested and then it can be, okay, that makes sense. Right. So see, like, for example, you are looking for text on the screen. Uh -huh. You are looking for a button and you're making sure that the start button is not there because we've already started the game mm -hmm. and then blah, blah, blah. So, so like you're, you're seeing whether when you do something, whether it flips the, the state. So um, would you, I guess what I'm trying to wrap my head around is like most of the teams I've been on, these, these kind of things end up being in like Cypress or Selenium and a QA automation person's writing it. Um, so it is, so the value of this is maybe testing complex interactions with components, developer testing of complex interactions with yes. components. That game example may be something that, you know, a QA person would cover. I'm wondering, is it worth like writing both levels and repeating it? So, pro okay, so probably this could put a little less burden on the Cypress, de Cypress developer. If, if the logic is being tested, the developer should know the logic and be able to test the logic better, I think. Mm -hmm. So then the idea is if I hit this page and I do this high level interaction, does this general thing work could be less code in the Cypress test and a little more code in this test is my theory on this. Um, that's how I would kind of break this up. Um, but the other thing about this is these run a lot faster than a Cypress test does because the Cypress test has to spin up the entire environment, log yep. in, do its work, log out, you know, that kind of thing. So it's more involved but that one is much closer to the user. So it's even further along than this um, in terms of the, the level you're testing. You're really testing the moving parts. Yeah, this seems to be good for like your, your publishing component that a lot of developers or, pe teams yeah. or people in your company are gonna use. And 
you want to test that component, like test the crap out of that component. Like, like one of those, like, here's a list of things you can select. Here's the list that you selected yeah. all one remove, remove all. That's mm -hmm. one that I would think you'd probably want to have this type of test on because you want to test every piece of functionality deeply and make sure the cool. methods are called and that kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. So, okay. So I know that's a little bit of a diatribe, but that was what this blog is talking about. So for example, you know, it, it goes into, you know, like staying away from implementation details. Um, you know, for example, like you want to do things like avoid the DOM structure, avoid class names where you can, avoid component internal state, uh, don't assert third party code. Whose job is that? Third party environment, you know? Um, so, you know, you tr try not testing the library you're using, uh, try testing your code. Um, like you don't want to test all of React, for example, that that's React's job. <laughs> um, but if you're using it, it better work the way you want it to be to work, right? So we're using Axios in this, or Fetch in this networking example. Sure, you're going to use Fetch. Make sure that when you call it, it brings back what you need as part of your test. Um, but you don't want to really like go to the real back end. You can mock that data that comes back if you want to, you know? So all sorts of stuff you could do here. So interesting read. I think. All right. So next topic uh, would be J deploy. So I haven't researched this too much, but recently I was talking to some folks about deploying Java apps in multiple environments, and there's various ways to do that, and installers or you know you write your own scripts for each platform. And apparently this is something that kind of takes care of all of that. So once you have your executable jar. You can basically build, you know, you can just run this tool to get an installer, you know, deployable for any platform, Mac, Linux, or Windows. So it seems to simplify all of that. I haven't tried this out yet, um, but it, it's something that I think environment companies or teams that are still using Java, but their clients are on multiple environments and it's not on the cloud. So they're, you're deploying something on-prem. Uh, mm -hmm. This could be useful. Cool. Very neat. All right. This is just uh, kind of a chuckle. Um, cores is one of those things that I think not a lot of developers understand when they first look at it and tend to kind of shift away from if they can use a proxy instead. Let me explain what cores is in the first place. So when you go from a browser and you hit a website and it downloads a front end like React or Angular or Vue, uh, or even just takes JavaScript and brings it down in general. There's a sandbox built into the browser, right? And the sandbox says, you can only go back to where you came from. I can't call a network API from a completely separate website. I can't do a post or a put or a delete on a separate website. And that's because they don't want, uh, they don't want security issues. Um, you know, like uh, someone hacking and putting a script on your page that then goes back and takes your cookies and uses yeah. them to do something and then steals your information. Um, so cores is a set of headers that the original site brings back uh, that says, oh, by the way, browser, I'm also allowing you to go here. And the reason this might happen is because maybe your website is on a content delivery network. So like the static page um, the HTML and the JavaScript compiled and the CSS and all that stuff is just delivered from a really fast set of servers that are like replicated around the world for really fast, low latency rendering it of, of static content. So your app gets downloaded, but then you have to go back and maybe log in or maybe get a piece of data from something. So there's a couple of ways to deal with that. One way to deal with that is to kind of make part of your, part of your URL that you go to, the website you go to could be a slash API and then that basically through a proxy tunnels to the app, app server itself. And so your browser seems to look at the same website, but a piece of that website actually goes all the way back to the back end and comes back again. So there's no separate website. It just looks like it's all on the same physical website to the browser. And then you don't need cores. But if you have resource servers, which are network servers out other than the one you came from, and you wanna call rest endpoints on different services, uh, like a caching uh, service or a data service that, that someone provides for you, um, then your browser has to come back and call that other third-party endpoint. The Cores API is meant exactly for this. Um, and so you'll see headers um, and the headers that come back, I'm probably not, I should have done a little bit more research 
uh, and grab the good example. But here, cores, headers. I'll just grab a random. There we go. So, uh, and that's actually a good one. So this is the, the Mozilla developer network, right? So you have a web server here and a web server there, and you want to be able to get data from another web server. The cores headers that come back look like, uh, hold on. There, yeah, there we go. Access control, allow origin. Um, and so that's one of the cores headers. Okay. So it basically says uh, in this example, Hey browser, I didn't put a sandbox on your API call. So go out and get whatever you need. Now, the thing is, the reason this, uh, is important is because this isn't security. Right. What this is doing is just restricting the browser. If the browser is written to honor cores, which Chrome and Firefox and edge and all the major browsers honor cores request headers. And they will prevent you from going and doing third-party calls to other places. Um, but it's not a security thing. It's just a restriction thing so that it's, it doesn't make it easy for someone to attack based on your page. Right. Um, you know, so here's a, a better example of like it's actually targeting a particular endpoint. And there's other details to this that we can get into. But let's, let's, let's uh, kind of put that aside for the moment. So well, where is this course? There it is. Okay. So the article he's talking about, he ran into this article that someone talked about in Drupal. Uh, they had a Vue.js app. Drupal is a content management system and blog system. So he was using an API key as authentication. But the, the, the developer actually embedded the, this is really kind of worse. The developer embedded the API key in the source code of the front end application and then built the application and delivered it. And so the point being that I, I think if you read that quickly and looked at a demo and said, oh, I can put an API key in my code and cores will protect me, cores isn't protecting you. In fact, if you can get to that page, you can look at the API key and you can send it off to somebody else and do something with it. So A, never use API keys that you embed in the source code in the browser when you build it, because that's crazy, <laughs> right? Authenticate yourself. And, and if you are going to use an API key, call the server that has the API key that does a, a second level call to another server, right? So you can have the server do the API key call for you and come back. So you at least authenticate to your server and then it's all hidden behind the back end system. Like you can, you can use like a, a back end for front end is that the term you'll hear for that is you'll have a website that you connect to that has your standard REST stuff. And if you need to do something off your website, you could get the app server to do it for you and it could have an API key, but you still authenticate the safe way. <laughs> Pardon me while I learn how to use my microphone. You could authenticate safely and actually use a, an authentication mechanism. But cores is not gonna save you. Cores is not something that you're supposed to think of as security. It's more of just kind of sandbox protection as a, a last level last ditch effort to prevent you from hurting yourself. So anyway, it was kind of an interesting article. Um, but basically the, the takeaway here is if you use an API key, please don't put it in the source code. And one of the comments made was, well, but I put it in an environment variable one and then I built the app. When you do that, the build tool takes the environment variable and slaps it in the source code and puts it in. Right. It's still there. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing to remember is when you obfuscate and minify code in JavaScript for the browser, strings are still strings. They don't get obfuscated. So an API key is not going to get put in some weird compressed language. Any string you put in the browser is a string. So it's still there in the source code. The rest of them might be really hard to understand, but then you'll see this nice shiny key that you can pluck out and do what you want. So please don't embed API keys yeah. and please don't think Cores is going to save you from anything dangerous when you do that. Exactly. I mean, even in not applicable to this, but even in program source code, if you have strings, oh. if you do a hex dump heap dump of the, you're going to see those strings. Yep. Strings, a string, a string. Absolutely. Yeah. Fun stuff. I know that's obvious for a lot of people, but if you're just getting started in, in front end development, be very wary of using API keys in a browser app, put them somewhere else, put them on a server, still authenticate every time. And maybe we'll have a discussion at some point about like uh, J JSON web tokens, because that's another area that people get confused about uh, for when you actually do get authenticated, you hold on to a token, what that does. That's another whole area. I found this uh, kind of interesting. So uh, field programmable gate arrays, this is kind of an IOT uh, topic. 
uh, and actually more like a board programming and chip programming mm -hmm. topic. Um, so you have a couple different ways of, of designing uh, logic chips in the world. Uh, one of them is to actually burn the logic into the chip itself. And so you actually have something that can't be upgraded and it's actually designed like a CPU um, or like if you've got an IO, IO controller that's like very specific and they, they burn this into the actual chip itself and it's like permanently wired. But as people are developing uh, hardware, uh, field programmable gate arrays, they've been around for a long time. And what they do is they basically let you flash circuits and you know upgrade them later uh, depending on what you need. So the idea is you use a design tool and you design in software to then write to the field programmable gate array to act like a set of chips or a, yeah. like a particular chip. And you have like ASICs, which are burned in, like you're saying, that are specific. And you have FPGAs, which are general purpose. Right, right. And so what's interesting is uh, it looks like Google uh, is working with some others to create a field programmable gate array interchange format. So you can export and import these uh, designs from one uh, system to another. Uh, and so they have this hardware description language um, that they, they transfer around uh, with these tools. And the idea is now uh, you have a, a standard format you can use to transfer them between tools, which is kind of interesting. I wasn't even thinking of this ever really, but it makes some sense. I mean, I'm sure a lot of these tools are expensive and very specific, uh, but... Uh, yeah. In, so in certainly my digital circuit design courses in college, there's like Verilog and VHDL. And mm -hmm. we had to we had to build a 32-bit processor in VHDL. Right. Right. Interesting. So anyway, kind of cool. Here's another one that's caught my eye. Now I only spent a couple seconds on this one, but I'm like, I didn't even realize you could do this. But um, you can create a Mac OS virtual machine on Apple Silicon. So you can run Mac OS in a virtual machine on an on Apple Silicon Mac. I didn't really even think of doing that before. I guess you could do that with Parallels on a regular Intel Mac. Is that right? But usually I, I would be putting Linux I've on. Done, I've never done, never done that before. Yeah, me either. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But it looks like there's like a tool you can run from, from Xcode or from the, from the uh, command line. Uh, install an image. You have to have like the Mac OS uh, install environment and so this is just a sample using you know basically um objective c or swift uh -huh. to set up an image and install stuff and try things out it's kind of neat it could be an interesting way to try out like a if you don't want to upgrade to the latest version of mac os right away but you want to like test it out right you could do that in the vm potentially but look it's all code right it seems like a lot of leg lifting you know hmm Anyway, but the bottom line is you can run a, a Mac OS virtual machine in Apple Silicon. You just have to, you know, use it looks like a fair amount of code. I'll have to take a look and see if this is something you could do from the other tools like Parallels, but probably not. Probably this is an Apple specific thing. I don't know. Anyway, that's our news for the week. Um, kind of a grab bag again this week. Uh, and then our other topic uh, we're going to talk about and kind of kick around a little bit. This is more free form too, uh, but. I was uh, thinking for topics that we can chew on. And one of them is just like how, how developers learn new things and keep track of new things and how we try to digest information. Uh, so, you know, I kind of call this the continuous learning topic today because one of the things you do all the time as developers, you're constantly learning new tech. It's, it, it never, you'll never run into a time where you don't have to pick up something new as a software engineer. Um, there's just, there's too many things you have to solve and, and, and too many things that, that require somewhat of a newer approach to things that, you know, better tooling, uh, you know, better APIs, things like that. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to take it from the trainer and speaker and, you know, experimenting with new technologies side of things. Uh, and I think uh, if, if we're, we're approaching this right, Sujan's going to jump in and talk about day to day on a project or like as you're building and working with different teams how you put together your knowledge of what something is and how you want to go uh, about breaking it down. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so first of all, uh, I want to do a little tiny plug up front and only when I find the tab, I have it. I don't know what book you're going to talk about. I have a guess in my mind. So I'm, I'm very excited to see if my guess is correct. Okay. It is. Pragmatic. It is. Yes. It is. 
this is probably one of my favorite books I've ever read. Um, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning Refactor Your Wetware from Andy Hunt. I know way back in our archives of the Chariot Tech Cast that you're li listening slash watching now, we have the audio version of his presentation. I'm not sure if we have it with video, but I know that we, you know, he spoke, he was one of our keynotes in 2009. Um, excellent, excellent book. And yeah. so a lot awesome. of the techniques, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you read this thing, right? Yeah, no, I'm just saying it, it is a fantastic book. It really is. Um, where's the look inside? So I'll probably get copyright violation for this. But uh, so the thing is, it goes through uh, a whole bunch of topics and I will not let people steal that screenshot. You should buy the book. But um, it, it goes through basically the, the journey that you have. In, and it's not just a single journey from novice to expert. Um, and so that's one of the things they, they cover is like, you know, you're, you're going through this journey all the time. And one of the things it covers is the Dreyfus module of learning, uh, Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. So Dreyfus uh, are their brothers, Stuart and Hubert Dreyfus. And in 1980, they had a report, University of California in Berkeley um, for the Air Force. And they talked about these five distinct stages of learning something, uh, you know, getting to, to mastery. Uh, and so this is well known. Um, but uh, so let's see here. So there's, there's these, these levels you go through, right? And so you start as a novice. You don't know anything about something. So you're really kind of looking all over the place for information. Uh, and you're, 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 you're just looking at so many sources and just trying to get a feel for something. And you, and you, you really want to find some kind of predefined patterns or examples to work with because you need structure early on as you're learning. You get to an advanced beginner. Now you have situations you can apply. And like, I'm, I know a little bit about this, so I'm going to try a few things. And as you get further along, you become competent in it and you have more of a holistic view of this, this thing you're learning. Uh, once you become proficient, it becomes less of a mechanical process of like going through and physically learning something and, and repeating it and more intuitive. Like you look at it and say, I know this needs this. And then eventually you're an expert and you're completely absorbed in it and just comes out of you like water. Um, so that's the Dreyfus model of education. There's different, you know, other opinions on, on way people learn a whole bunch of learning theory. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, it's not a bad way of thinking of how you kind of uh, progress as a learner. And so that among a bunch of other things like the Dunning Kruger effect, which is like, you think you're an expert when you're really not an expert boy, I'm sure I've been guilty of that a number of times in my life. Um, yeah. We all are. And, uh, you know, so, so there's so many things that are really good pieces of this book. Um, but let's talk about like, maybe you're diving into a new uh, technology. So for example, right now, I'm spending a lot of time with uh, the Google performance metrics. And so I'm researching uh, a talk on that and, and specifically around, you know, showing how you can optimize like React applications to speed up the interactivity and to quickly download them and start them so that people don't browse away from you. This is things like Google Lighthouse and Google's mm -hmm. develop web developer site and talking about, you know, first contentful paint, last con last contentful paint, et cetera, uh, all the different specs. So as you're learning, um, you're going to go through some things and the things you go through are like, you just kind of, as I said before, you're browsing around, you're bookmarking things, you're trying to find stuff that sticks. And so I'll go through a phase in the very beginning where I'm just trying to find as much as possible without going super deep into any one thing so that I can kind of bookmark things I want to come back to later and just see what everyone is talking about, everyone is writing about, about the general topic. And so it's kind of like you spray all that information all over the place into bookmarks and, and, and just start taking small notes. And then after that, I generally try to see, is there a way that I can just try this thing out? Can I kick some tires? Can I... Can I try some samples that already exist? Can I try to code a little bit and see how accessible the, li the library is? Sometimes you get lucky and in certain things, it just clicks with you uh, and you can get some stuff done early on. But if you're trying to learn Scala that way, buckle up. It's a long ride. You know, it just depends on what you're trying to learn, how dense it is and how critical it is um, in terms of it's, it's, it's uh, you know, everything's connected to each other, how complex it is. So what I'd like to do after I've, I've hacked around a little bit and done some experiments um, is I, I usually mind map. Um, I really am a fan of this. Now, some people are visual learners. I kind of find myself to be a visual learner. Um, and so I use a mind mapping tool. And I'm, the one I use is called MindNode. 
Uh, it's a $30, $40 tool uh, on Mac. It's not an advertisement. I'm just letting you know that's the one I use. There is a free one out there, uh, free mine. I don't like it. It's much more clunky. But here's my node, for example. So here's me researching uh, page speed metrics in the Lighthouse tool. And you know, you can you can fold nodes and open it back up again. Um, you can, one of the most important things is you can export things to Markdown, for example, and throw them in a note. Uh, so you can text search them later. Uh, I can start a presentation that way just based on notes that I make and kind of use like a Markdown based presentation tool to, to, to put those together. But I find, I find uh, mind mapping to be really, really useful. Uh, in fact, it's kind of one of my go-tos for a lot of things. So for example, for React testing library, I spent a lot of time in there uh, for the blog. And I've got a lot of just chunks of information I've gathered over time that I then turn into a outline to search. So I had, okay, that, that was my question to search. Like I have, mm -hmm. I have a good understand. I don't use this that much, but I, I have an understanding of the right side of this, right? Like I'm getting information and I'm organizing it. So I understand the right side. How do you read it back? Like what is your optimal way of then going back and using this? So I will look visually as I'm continuing to learn, but mm -hmm. ultimately I just copied it to the clipboard. Now I have an outline. I have a All tabbed right. outline, which is great. So this is what I'll end up putting in my note tool when I'm done with my research. And then okay. when I'm searching, I'll hopefully find it later and go, oh, that's that, awesome. You know. I, mean, so I do this, but I don't do the mind map first. I just go right to this, which would be mm -hmm. interesting because the other way is easier to visualize. And then Oh, continue. yeah, and you can move things around. You know, it's, and then it's really it. that's an awesome idea. I'm going to start doing that. Yeah, pretty cool. And Andy Hunt really uh, advocated for this early on in his book. Like one of the things he recommended, in addition to kind of playing with something and experimenting and see what you can figure out, is mind mapping. And that's where I started doing it. And I have a on my OneDrive, I've got a mind map directory with a ton of them in there. So yeah, it really helps, especially if you're going to try to figure out, like if you're going to present something to somebody. I find it's a great way of visualizing before you present. Like, am I going way too deep off the end on one topic? And is it not balanced out with, say, ex <laughs> examples, which is like nothing in this example here. But you know what I mean? You can see where you spent more or less of the research and what you may need to fill out, for example. And then, like I said, I like to put things in a note tool. Uh, so I have been using, and I'm getting, we get your curiosity on this. I originally started out using Evernote. Um, that was a note-taking tool that I used a lot. And it was because at the time, I think I had like an Android smartphone way back then. There was a nice Evernote client for that. And I think I had the Note 2 and I was able to write handwritten notes. Um, and I really got into handwritten notes, which is what I'm doing a lot of with my iPad. And before that yeah. was some stylus stuff. I, um, I did yeah, four different things, which just shows how fractured my mind is. But I've been using Evernote for years. Mm -hmm. And so out of inertia... I still use Evernote for a bunch of work-related stuff. For mm -hmm. personal stuff, I've been using Notion. I've yeah. been, I somehow, for some reason, go back and forth on on um, OneNote, right? Microsoft's mm -hmm. product, um, which is nice. Um, I think it's better than Evernote, and I probably should switch to it. I mean, at one point, mm -hmm. I had exported everything over to there, but the export didn't go well, and then I just went back to Evernote. And then I that also use... That is a problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And I also mm -hmm. use... Um, Get the name of the app on the iPad. It's a really nice note-taking app, with, and it works great with the Apple Pencil. Um, mm -hmm. I forget the name now. Um, so yeah, yeah I've I mean, tried all of them. <laughs> I, I I know, and I, I would bet that almost every one of us does. Like, um, let me see. I'm just trying to find a good note to to, to bring up, like uh, conference notes. Here we go. So. I think these are all safe to show on the screen. So like I was doing a lot of taking notes at conferences and good luck reading this later. One of the things I find though, is that I remember things better if I take the time to take the notes, even if I end up not using the notes later because yeah. I, just, I had to get it down somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think you're, I think I had read something somewhere like, you know, writing things down, exercise, like the motor, Muscle movements actually basically exercises parts of the brain. And I think it makes stronger associations with memory. And I do think that like typing them doesn't like, I, I know yeah. I've typed things and I'm really fast at typing stuff. It's that's the ones I'll look at later because I know I can, I can keep pace with the pe person who's speaking, but I can't remember anything I typed afterward because I was so busy just transcribing. Right. Um, but when you're drawing, you get a chance to like really kind of, you know, spend a little time in there and stretch a little bit. Um, so, yeah. If, if, if someone can read Ken's notes, we will uh, give you a prize. 
<laughs> no one can read Ken's notes. Kinesis Analytics, 11 cents for CPU. I can read it. Oh my gosh. Write it down, somebody. All right. So anyway, so one note, I agree with you completely, by the way, on one note, because the thing is, um, with one note, the, the notepads, the notes themselves, the books, um, have their own little internal logic to them. Right. So you've got things yeah. like you've got the, uh, you know, you've got the, the different subfolders and you've got like a hierarchy and they don't have tags. Like I love the tags in Evernote mm -hmm. where you could tag something and yeah. it's much harder to, it's much harder to retrieve from, from one note than it is Evernote to me, like one note, you have to really think about your structure up front. Whereas with Evernote, it's all about the tags. That's, I think, the major, major difference. Like tags to me are much more consumable and usable and searchable in Evernote. So, But the handwriting experience is worse in Evernote, in my opinion. Um, in OneNote, you can write anywhere in the notes, scroll around. It's really great that way. All right. And then, so that's that. And then let's see here. Uh, let me see what else I want to say about those topics. Um, Oh, and so some other things. So as you get to the point where you, you've done a lot of this kind of mind map, you've done some research, you got a whole bunch of bookmarks sitting there. Uh, you got a lot of things you're looking at uh, and you want to try something out. You know, you need something to work on. You need some sort of project to, to, to attack, right? I mean, the problem is you, you hear all the time, use it in anger, right? I've got to use this framework in anger. That just simply means I've got to actually do something with it. I can't just sit there and read about it because reading about it tells you nothing. Running someone else's example just shows a little bit about what it can do, but you don't understand the surface and the amount of work that it takes to actually get that to happen, right? So um, it's good to write um, like a sample project, but another way to do it is to put together a blog article. Um, and I know that we've done that for years just because we like sharing information, but it also helps us crystallize our thoughts. Because the other thing that, that is iterated through in refactoring wetware and also in general is if you can't explain it to somebody else, you don't really know it well enough. Um, there's nothing like having to get up and talk to somebody about a technology make you really consider the angles on it. So I really find telling other people about something is a really good way of synthesizing the knowledge in a better and stronger way. Yeah, I'm going to touch upon that too. Okay, cool. So why don't we talk about, let's turn the tables and let's talk about uh, uh, making a model. Uh, sure. Or I, I know you have notes in yours, so why don't we take take it your your uh, direction? Cool. So something that has always helped me understand things better, and most of the stuff that we work with is complicated. You can't really fit all of it into your head at once. There's so many different layers, so many different things going on. If you try to attack it all at once, it's, it's not really possible. It kind of falls apart. So making a model is something that has always uh, kind of helped me out. You know, a model is an approximation of something complex. Um, mm -hmm. It allows you to investigate something in a controlled environment under parameters of your choosing, and you can make some simplifying assumptions. So you're basically, you're trying to answer a question about something you don't know. So the first step in a model is like, what are you trying to answer? What are you trying to learn? If you don't know that, if you don't know your objective, it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, what path do you take in learning? Um, and in programming, we're kind of constantly always modeling things. We model concepts, domain objects, processes, um, real life things. So you're distilling it to aspects you're interested in and building something and running it. So we kind of do that with abstraction, right? With functions, classes, interfaces, finite state machines, you know, you name it. So we're building systems that ultimately model real world interactions. Um, my takeaway from modeling is don't be afraid to write some code to explore an unknown concept. Start simple and iterate. Um, take That has always helped me understand more complex things and breaking it apart. Uh, and you could take this from a non-technical perspective and say, like, you know, thought experiments. When you're trying to learn something complex, you run a thought experiment. Like, well, okay, let me come up with some contrived scenario and run it through my head. And you're basically coming up with a model and you're trying to understand how something would work. And I kind of do that with new technologies. Like when I was looking at Kafka or looking at AWS lambdas, I was first coming up with a model in my head. Like, okay, what do I need to know about Kafka? There's network IO, there's disk IO, there's a processor and memory to, to process the messages, process requests for writing messages and, and sending messages out. And like, as you build these models in your head of how something works, you kind of get a deeper understanding of it. And same with lambdas and stuff like that. So I think it's a great way 
to take something you may think is complex and demystify it. Like when you break it down to a model, it makes it a lot less scary. Or as someone else said, uh, people who build those things are just like us. They just happen to have built that thing you like, you know, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. still built from things that other people would write if they had the time to do it yeah. too, you know, or the, and, um, I think something else you started touching upon, which I think is a good segue I can talk about is like, how do you take that? Mm -hmm. Or I should say how I, you know, how do I take yeah. that first step when I'm learning something new? Um, the first step is really daunting. You may have a blank editor staring back at you, right? He's like, what do I do? I, I don't have anything to start with. Um, so one of the first things I do is organizing information and Ken mentioned like mind maps. So I start mm -hmm. with writing out the questions I'm interested in answering, which also includes stating things I don't know. And so to be honest about what you know, that's great. It's a great way to start learning. I, ha I have to admit, I don't know these things. To me, that's my first step. Um, once I list those questions out, it kind of helps me organize information as I'm researching, which now after hearing what Ken said, I'm going to try to put that into a, into that mental, into that mind map tool first. Um, Cool. Once I've done that, I start with kind of a thin slice method, build something really small, a single feature end to end. Um, and one thing that helps me for that is test driven development. You know, start with your outcome, your expectations, and then write a little bit of code to produce that outcome. Um, this gives you a mini environment to get rapid feedback. So that thin slice method allows you to attack something small without getting too deep. Um, another thing is peering inside the black box. So if you're trying to learn how an existing piece of code works or a library, you know, start with an existing project and a debugger. Step through it. Don't be afraid to run different scenarios. Um, write down the steps, capture log files if they're available, snapshot data if you can, and then go back and, and look through it to see like, okay, what did that thing do? You can gain a lot of knowledge around reading the code, debugging the code. There's a great book I have. Um, I'll have to plug it later because I don't remember the author and the publisher. It's called, I think it's called how, Reading Code like that, and Reading mm -hmm. Open code and, and actually getting better at your craft by reading the tons of open source code that oh that's there. cool yeah how solve problems there's so many experts that have done it before that you can learn from um, now you wouldn't copy and paste that code as ken mentioned earlier but you can use it to learn um and then the other thing is explaining it to someone else or explaining it to a five-year-old you know try to explain something to someone else requires you to really know the subject and can reveal gaps in your knowledge so that could be gathering around a whiteboard and talking or writing a blog post or making a video or building a tutorial. And there's no harm in saying, Ooh, I didn't realize I don't know that. That's that's it's, it's like every week when we do the dev news, I'm like, Oh, and that area, right. I didn't study deeply enough into that one, but it's true. Like All the time day. in tech you'll realize. Yeah. 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 It's just to be humble about it and realize that no one knows everything. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. So uh, hopefully that's been helpful. You, do you have other stuff that you want to cover? Or you? I do. I wasn't sure if I, I was. I wasn't sure if there's other stuff you want to cover first before I get to that. No, I'm, I'm actually. I think I'm depleted. Okay, <laughs> my knowledge is depleted right now. All right, from so, what I was prepared to talk about. Cool. Uh, thank you. So the final thing I think I, I wanted to mention was like learning how to communicate technical and non-technical information. I think the number one problem I've seen in my career across any project is communication. That that trumps not having knowledge or about a language or a framework or technology, but not being able to communicate effectively, not knowing what problem you're actually solving and what the expectations are, that tends to be the, the biggest problem. So I think as, as engineers, it's really important to learn how to communicate. You're always communicating, whether it's your code, whether it's Git commits, whether it's, uh, sorry, Git commit messages, whether it's documentation, yeah. project status, requirements, a value proposition of doing something, um, it is something that takes a lot of practice. There's no, you know, knowing your audience is critical and which questions they'd like to answer to help them make decisions. So there's no silver bullet here. I'm not proposing a solution. You know, no. you got to be willing to show your work to others, be open to feedback and don't be married to ideas or opinions. Um, the better you get at this, the deeper your understanding of the problem becomes. So um, for me, like to organize my information from the perspective of my intended audience, I tend to always fall back to user the user story format. So the user story format is, as a person, user, of role, et cetera, I want to achieve some goal so that some outcome or some reason happens. Um, this can be done for non-technical and technical audiences or problems. So a few examples, like as a project manager, I want to know the blocker and which tasks it impacts so that I can help remove obstacles and adjust the plan accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. As an operations person, I want to know how long transactions take so that I can build a performance dashboard and create appropriate alerts. 
Um, as a power user, I want to write a custom query to retrieve data so that I can generate a custom report that is not provided out of the box. Um, another example, as a developer, I want commit messages to answer these questions so that I can see a list of all major changes between two points in time just via commit messages. So I purposely picked not software related things like non-technical things because this format is really powerful for getting in the mind of the person you're trying to help out or answer yeah. questions of. And it's always helped me organize things better and actually see things in a different way. And to go back to your earlier point about the biases and like um, everything can be solved this way or I can use this technology to do X, Y, and Z. Stepping out of that and looking at the user story a lot of times helps you realize, well, do I really need to write this this way or do I need to write this piece of code? Is it actually going to solve the user's problem? It's just always helped me out a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great stuff. All right. Uh, let me just pop the uh, browser back up a sec, I think, as soon as I find it. Yeah, Miles, I'm going to put the browser back up again. Here it goes. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much for, for uh, being on the show today and uh, watching us. We appreciate all of our viewers and you can subscribe at chariotsolutions.com slash techcast. I'm sorry, slash podcasts. Uh, and that's where our RSS feed is. Or you can search on, you know, uh, Apple iTunes, uh, sorry, the Apple store, whatever it is these days, music store. Uh, you can look on uh, Amazon Music. You can look on Spotify. We're all over the place. So we're registered there. Uh, also, you can hit us up on YouTube. Uh, we are at chariotsolutions.com. Uh, or sorry, youtube.com slash chariotsolutions. I mentioned before at the top of the show. Uh, remember, we got ETE coming up, uh, and that's April 19th to 20th. And also, we are hiring. So if you are looking to work with other technologists who love continual learning and improvement and you know make our customers uh, success their success, uh, you know, that's what we bring to the table. So we have open positions and we're always looking for good people. Yeah. So especially right, now and then mobile data engineers, yep. you know, absolutely. So we thank you and we appreciate it. If you want to contact us, feel free, feel free to hit us up on Twitter at, uh, at TechCast. Um, you can also email us at techcastfeedback at chariot solutions.com. Uh, I'll post that in the link in the, uh, the notes there. But otherwise, uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks. Awesome. Thanks.